Do you need a pep talk? I need a pep talk like 24-7. Someone to follow me around and tell me fun movies to watch and recommend small businesses to support. You just described the Total SF podcast. Bay Area culture, fun guests, cable car bell ringing. We're your pandemic support group led by the Chronicles Peter Hartlob and Heather Knight. New episode every Friday morning. Subscribe to Total SF wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm Damian Bulwa. Today on Fifth and Mission, why are some people in the Bay Area, in some places in the Bay Area, getting vaccinated at much lower rates than everyone else? To find out, we sent reporters to zip codes that had some of the lowest rates. What they found was complicated, a mix of vaccine hesitancy, conspiratorial thinking, and in some cases, explanations like, I just haven't had time. My first guest, Chronicle reporter Julie Johnson, will get into that story And later on the show, we're going to have reporter Ryan Costin to discuss another crucial demographic to watch in the pandemic, people who are immunocompromised and thus at greater risk of serious illness or death from COVID-19. But first, Julie Johnson. Julie, how are you? I'm good. Thanks. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for coming on, Julie. So first, tell us about why you wanted to find these zip codes with low rates of vaccination. We were curious to know where more people were delaying or just deciding not to get vaccinated to figure out which neighborhoods were most impacted. And then we wanted to go there and talk to people and find out why. All right. These are pockets around the Bay Area, but you ended up with what places? We ended up with three places. We went by zip code, and that's based on state data. We went to Treasure Island. We went to East Oakland. And then we went to Antioch in Contra Costa County. All right. So Overall, we'll get into, you know, what you found at the scene. But overall, it's not quite as simple as the talking points we hear, right? I mean, it, it, it got pretty complicated. It is complicated. There were a lot of people who believed in some of the conspiracy theories, believed that the vaccines might harm them or were part of some government plan. But there were also a lot of people who were incredibly busy, whose lives are very complicated who were simply unsure and had never had that trusted person to ask questions of about how was this made? How was it made so quickly? Things like that. Yeah, it seemed like you were talking to people who who really believe the conspiracies in some cases, but other people who kind of knew they were conspiracies. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I talked to a woman, a young woman in her 20s, who saw this video on TikTok that looked like a deep fake to me. It depicted Jill Biden on the White House, you know, outside of the White House, saying very dramatically conspiratorial things about the vaccine, things that Jill Biden has not said publicly in trusted forums. And when I said to her, why do you think that's real? She looked back at me and said, why do you think anything you've ever read is real? Wow, well, that's that seems like a difficult problem to to get around, Julie. Let's let's go to Antioch. I mean, tell me about where you went and who you talked to. I went with county public health workers who have an ambassador vaccine ambassador program, much like other places. And what they do is they've hired all these workers who come from the neighborhoods. They live there, and they stand in front of grocery stores. They go to strip malls. They go to, you know, community festivals and have information about the vaccines and are willing to just talk with them and have those tricky, sometimes um, really vivid conversations with people about the vaccines and why the county workers believe they can trust them and that they're safe. So these people you were with, they don't see it as a lost cause. They see an ability to persuade, it sounds like. Absolutely. You know, I talked to one man who runs the program who said even if they go out and one day only vaccinate one person, they feel like that is a win because that person will go back and say to people they know, you know, I got vaccinated. The symptoms weren't so bad. You know, I decided to do this and can bring that message back that they made that choice. Julie, tell us about this zip code in Antioch. What's it like? Well, this is actually a part, a portion of the zip code of Antioch that I spent time in, um, the Sycamore neighborhood. 
And um, it is a young community and it is an impoverished community. The median age is 26 years old and the per capita income is $16,000 a year. And that compares to Contra Costa as a whole, which has a per capita income of about $48,000 a year. There are a lot of apartments, a lot of condos. It's very tightly packed. It's right along Highway 4. And when you're out there talking to people, what is their sort of general reaction to being asked about vaccination? You know, it varied. When we were outside of a grocery store, people um, people were busy in their lives. They were going there to shop. So a lot of people were kind of taken aback to see the public health workers there. And the ones who stopped were pretty curious about it and had a ton of questions One woman I spoke to, she actually worked at the grocery store and took her break to come and get vaccinated. She was 21 years old. And when I asked her why she hadn't been vaccinated yet, she said she worked double shifts six days of the week and really just didn't have the time. So this was her first opportunity to do it because she could just take five minutes off of work, get back to it. It sounds like for some of these workers, just getting vaccines out to the community, they felt like was enough. And of course, one of those zip codes was Treasure Island, which is very isolated in San Francisco. You're exactly right. And Nanette Asimov, when she was reporting, found that the last time they had vaccinations available on Treasure Island was, I believe, June. That is certainly an isolated community. And Antioch and East Oakland, in their own unique ways, are isolated, too, sometimes isolated by access to health care and access to resources to take time off work, to have a relationship with a doctor they can ask questions of and make those decisions. So it sounds like, again, it can be something that simple. You also spoke to City Council member Tamisa Torres Walker, who's a, uh, an important figure in Antioch. What, what did she say and how was she trying to get people vaccinated? Tamisa joined the county health workers at a quick stop retail strip in the Sycamore neighborhood when I was there. And she said she was on hand just to help people feel like these public health workers were welcome there and that she was available to ask any questions. Now, Tamisa said she really understood why people are hesitant to get vaccinated. Um, Tamisa, who is Black, said that historically many people in her community and in the black community have not been served well in medical settings. They haven't gotten the care they've needed. They haven't got the information they needed. And so she understood why people might be mistrustful. She herself was delaying getting vaccinated because she had COVID, said it was a horrible experience, and she was just frankly really worried about the side effects. She said she was going to get it, but she was really nervous about it, and so she was waiting. But she is now trying to convince others to get it as well. She was. She said mainly she wanted to make sure that anybody who had questions had someone to ask and that anyone who wanted it had somewhere to go. But she didn't feel like anyone should be forced. All right, well, it's a fascinating story. Thanks, Julie. You're welcome. Thank you. We're going to take a quick break on Fifth and Mission. When we come back, We'll talk to reporter Ryan Cost about the plight of people who are immunocompromised in the pandemic and efforts to get them a third dose of one of the vaccines right after this. You're listening to Fifth and Mission. You can support this show and the newsroom that creates it by signing up for unlimited access at sfchronicle.com slash pod or by downloading the San Francisco Chronicle app. Do you need a pep talk? I need a pep talk like 24-7. Someone to follow me around and tell me fun movies to watch and recommend small businesses to support. You just described the Total SF podcast. Bay Area culture, fun guests, cable car bell ringing. Where your pandemic support group, led by the Chronicles Peter Hartlob and Heather Knight, new episode every Friday morning. Subscribe to Total SF wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome back to Fifth and Mission. I'm Damian Bulwa. I'm joined now by Chronicle reporter Ryan Cost. Ryan, you've been talking to and spending a lot of time with people who are immunocompromised, and they've always been more at risk in the pandemic. But again, uh, we're talking about how important it is to address their needs. Why is that? So this story actually began when I was talking to an infectious disease specialist at UCSF, and he had mentioned that of the 40 
patients they had currently in the hospital who were dealing with COVID infections. Five of them had been vaccinated, and all five of them were actually immunocompromised patients. Specifically, they were either solid organ transplant recipients, or they had either lymphoma or leukemia. So really specific, really acute sorts of um, immunocompromised patients. Okay, and we're talking about them because there is now an effort underway to have these people be the first to get a third dose of of either the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine, right? Correct. Yeah. Just this week, actually, San Francisco and a couple other Bay Area counties uh, announced that these these populations would now have access to a third dose of either of the two mRNA vaccines. They can now go get those. They can talk to their primary care physicians about them, or in San Francisco, at least, you can actually go to a Safeway, a CVS, or a Walgreens and get a vaccine there, and you can just self-attest to your um, immunocompromised status. Okay, I want to get into the some of the complexities of giving this third dose, but first, tell us about some of these people you met. I was really fascinated by this Dave Potter you spoke to, who has found himself in this very difficult position. Yeah, actually, both patients that I spoke with um, were diagnosed with lymphoma, which is, you know, a cancer of the lymphatic system. And that system is really key to sort of the way that your body can fend for itself when it comes into contact with viruses and other illnesses. Um, as I was talking to Dave, he basically said, you know, like along with the rest of us, that June was a really great month for him at first because it seemed like we were turning a corner in the pandemic. And then a couple weeks in, he was actually diagnosed with this type of cancer, and that's sort of completely rearranged his life. Now he has to be, you know, extra careful. He is trying to stay home as much as possible. His partner is masking up for him if she ever goes out. She's asking her friends to mask up around her. So they're trying to create sort of a protective bubble around him because if he were to get COVID-19, the evidence is pretty clear that he'd be a much higher risk for a severe infection. Yeah, it's such a different situation, right? I mean, all of us went through this thing where we thought there was going to be a big reopening. There was a big reopening. It's hard to remember now in California. But for this group of people, the last uh, several weeks have been very different. Correct. Yeah, the other person that I spoke with, you know, he, he described it. This is a quote from him. It's just been like COVID, but 100 times worse. And he said, you know, when we were in that initial phase of lockdowns with COVID, you could at least sort of go out a little bit. You could go spend time with some people at a distance. But now his doctor has told him very specifically, stay at home as much as you can, wear a mask. She even suggested that he wear a mask around his two kids that are getting ready to go back to school, um, which may or may not be realistic for, for most people. Ryan, a couple of basics. I mean, when we talk about people who are immunocompromised, who is that? And currently, what are we seeing around the nation in terms of their hospitalization, their their rates of getting the disease? Sure. Okay. So the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have reported that they account for nearly half of the vaccinated people who have been hospitalized with COVID-19. So half of the breakthrough cases that wind up in the hospital. The CDC also says that they account for about 3% of the overall adult population in the United States. So you can obviously see a disparity there. When we talk about people who are immunocompromised or immunosuppressed, we're talking about a ton of different sort of things that could be happening. Um, The infectious disease specialist that I spoke with at UCSF sort of broke them down into a few different, you know, sort of zones. But the ones that are most concerning are the ones that San Francisco is targeting with those third doses. People with blood cancers, so lymphoma or leukemia. It also includes people who are in a late stage HIV infection. It can include people who have had stem cell transplants within the last two years, and also those who are currently on immunosuppressive medications and those who are taking high doses of certain drugs. All right. But you do say that another complication is whether these people will be even helped, or at least some of these people helped by a third dose. Sure. So I spoke with three different experts. Um, I spoke with one expert at UCSF who deals with sort of these blood cancers. And then I spoke with another doctor at Northwestern who works with infections in patients who have had solid organ transplants. Um, You know, they were both happy to hear that the CDC and, you know, San Francisco in particular had gone forward with this third booster, but they were also, 
I guess, pragmatic about the fact that it might not have the intended effect in every single one of their patients. One of them pointed me to a study recently out of the New England um, Journal of Medicine that showed that 55% of the solid organ transplant recipients that had received a third dose still failed to sort of get that immuno response that they're looking for after you get a vaccine. So that means that there's still going to be quite a few people who are immunosuppressed that will not necessarily find their solution through a third shot. And beyond the shots, are there other treatments? Or are there other hopes for these patients? Yes. So there are a couple of things that they talked about. One option, of course, is to get, you know, even a fourth shot sometime down the road and hope that maybe the fourth time's a charm. The other thing that one doctor that I spoke with at UCSF is you know, particularly interested in is something called monoclonal antibody therapy. Now, listeners may remember this because this was actually a therapy that then President Donald Trump received when he was tested positive for COVID. They have since sort of expanded the use of this therapy, and now they can use it for immunosuppressed people who might have just been in contact with folks who have COVID or who are in the very early stages of, of infection. They can also use it for people who are maybe in high-risk settings and have immunosuppressed um, systems in general. So like, let's say a doctor with arthritis, with rheumatoid arthritis. For these people, Ryan, that you're talking to that are once again facing real risk, what are their spirits like? How are they looking to the future? Yeah, well, I mean, both of the people that I spoke with for this story, they seemed you know, pretty sanguine about it. <laughs> They're going to do what they have to do. They both are really sort of uh, concentrating on being good patients for their doctors. They can't really control what other people are doing. But I did speak with one of them, and they said that they've seen on Facebook friends, you know, relatives, not necessarily close relatives, but, you know, broader family that have proudly said that they're not getting the vaccine. And, you know, when they see that, it just really gets to them because, of course, they're the ones who are most at risk if we just let Delta continue to rip through the population. And as soon as people get vaccinated, as soon as we sort of see Delta fall off that cliff, start to, you know, bend that curve back to zero, they can start living life in a way that's a little bit more like we used to. All right, another good reason to get vaccinated. Ryan Koss, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks to my guests today on Fifth and Mission, Chronicle reporters Julie Johnson and Ryan Cost, to King Kaufman for producing this episode, and thank you for listening.